Um, so we're going to start off this morning with uh, Lisejo's presentation. I'm just going to read his bio now. They're loading it. <laughs> um, so we've got Lisejo S. Maqueta. He's a lecturer at the National University of Lesotho in the Department of Economics and is the head of department. Uh, he pursued his PhD in, in economics at Peking University. He is an advisory academic board member of the African Economic Research Consortium. Uh, his research interests include foreign direct investment, growth, and finance. He is also a coordinator of the World Trade Organization Chairs Program at the National University of Lesotho um, and heads the Lesotho Human Development Report in collaboration with the United National Development Program. Uh, his dissertation collaboratively supervised under the World Trade Organization Program for doctoral students was awarded a 2022 third prize Peking University uh, Baopeng African Studies Distinction Thesis Award. Um, so as we said earlier, each presentation is going to be 15 minutes. Uh, so please allow each presenter to go through their presentations and then we'll take questions at the end of the session. Awesome. Over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm Lesoko Macheta from the National University of Lesotho. Um, my paper is titled The Industrial Policy in Southern Africa, the New Structure Economic Thinking Perspective. Uh, before I get into what the New Structure Economic uh, Thinking Perspective is, I think I need to give you a little bit of industrialization in Africa. Um, so industrialization, when we first started, the world was just fled. I mean, the per capita income of global economies was almost zero. The first phase of industrialization started in about in 17th century with the new Western offshores. And then later on, the Western Europe and many other regions of the world started to industrialize their economies. However, we see a lot of industrialization that happened in 1950. For this follows the World War II. However, we can see that the trend of industrialization in Africa remained stagnant. Now we need to understand why is it that all the regions of the world have industrialized except for Africa? Now, a lot of thinking of industrialization came after the World War II, and that's when we had the first phase of development thinking. Now, um, the first phase of development thinking was the structural economic system. The idea here was for African countries to catch up with the advanced and industrialized economies. So the governments of, of Africa played the developmental role in building the industries. But these industries that were built were the advanced industries, were the advanced industries that could be almost equal to those industries that were built in advanced economies. So the idea was to catch up. And also they imposed the protectionism policies on international trade to pro protect the domestic firms. However, this strategy um, led to what was called the government failure because in 1960s to 1970s, it became questionable. The results of the development, developmental role of the state became questionable. Then it collapsed in around 1970s and we had the new school of thought in, uh, in 1980s, which was called the neoliberalism economic thinking. The idea here was to rule out the government from the market. And then through what Adam Smith called the invisible hand, the market will be able to efficiently allocate resources in the economy. This system was a laissez-faire economic system. Um, so the idea was that the market will allocate, efficiently allocate resources in the economy. But, but the, the laissez-faire also in 19, 1990s, the results also became questionable. And that's when we had the term, the last decade in developing countries. The typical example of the Lisa's Frey economic system is the 10 recommendations from the World Bank, the Washington Consensus. The pronounced scholars like Stiglitz argue that 
those economists that adopted the 10 recommendations from the Washington consensus are now worse off relative to when before they adopted the 10 recommendations. And these recommendations were adopted mainly by developing countries and African countries. So now we need to ask ourselves, if all these schools of thoughts are so plausible and all other regions of the world were able to industrialize, then why didn't Africa industrialize in 1950s? What was the missing link there? One of the things that these schools of thoughts uh, ignored was to define a unique endowment resource structure of each economy, that each economy has unique endowment resource structure. Secondly, the government played the developmental role in building industries. So the government was actually the key in building industries in developing countries, whereas it ought to have played the facilitating role and let the competitive market play the efficient, the efficient role. Now, um, this brings us to the objective of this paper. So the objective of the paper is to rethink of the industrialized industrial policy in Africa. The second objective is to rethink of the role of the development financing institutions in industrialization. And the final objective is to give the conclusion and the recommendation from the paper. Now, Spence, when we think about industrialization, Spence in his paper of cross, uh, uh, yeah, Spence in 2008, emphasized that the 13 economies that experienced the growth rate of more than 7% for consecutive 25 years had these five characteristics in common. For instance, they, had the open, they were open to international trade. They had high levels of microeconomic stability to mention the few. But then in his conclusion, he argued that these are only ingredients to industrialization. So now the question is, what is the recipe for industrialization in Africa? And that's where now the new thinking, the new structural economic thinking comes in. It assesses on these four pillars that uh, it views development as a whole continuum with each level of development as a point, as a point at different levels of development. That's number one. Number two, each economy has its own unique endowment resource structure. The industrial upgrade is also a key. And finally, the government should be playing a facilitating role in the market. So there ought to be that interactive role, uh, role of the state and the, and the market for efficient allocation of, of resources. Now, what do these four points mean? They mean that, let's take the example of South Africa. Let's say we are at the very early stage of industrialization. It means that at that stage, the, let's say we are using only labor and capital as our endowment resource structure. At that early stage, it's likely to find that there is more labor than capital. So it means that the industries that you need to build should be the labor intensive industries. That way you keep high unemployment rate while you are also using the most uh, uh, abundant resources in the economy it becomes your competitive uh, strategy. So that's where you get your competitive advantage in the global market. However, in terms of industrialization, the key here is to move from labor intensive industries into capital intensive industries. For you to do that, it means that you have to keep, to keep on upgrading your industries from high labor intensive industries into capital intensive industries because that's capital is what makes the difference between industrializing uh, economies and least developed economies. And the government also must be playing the facilitating role in terms of collecting, collecting information, subsidizing the first mover firms because information has the characteristics of the public good. It's much expensive to collect, but once collected, the marginal cost of using that information by the next firm is almost zero. And that should be the role of the state, the facilitating role, not the, development, the, development, the developmental role in, in industrialization. Now, all that information, collection of information and industrial upgrade and everything, 
who should be uh, playing that, that key role. That's where the development financing institutions comes in. Um, I don't know why it keeps on going. <laughs> That's where the development financing institutions comes in. But we are not just talking about development financing institutions to finance industries. We are saying that they must find the optimal way of, fin of financing industries. What do we mean by that? We mean that, let's say now you are in the initial stage of industrialization, whereby you have more labor relative to capital. So you don't just finance any other industries, but you focus more on those industries that are utilizing the most abundant resources, capital, I mean, labor intensive industries. But then the mandate of the development financing institutions should also be dynamic in the sense that as you upgrade your industries from labor intensive industries into capital uh, intensive industries, the mandate of the development financing institution should also be dynamic and dynamically changing in line with the endowment, the abundance of the endowment resource structures in such economy. Um, now with that, I think uh, it's almost my conclusion that in industrialization in Africa, the most important factor is the endowment resource structure. So if in a particular country, we have more labor than capital, we should first start with utilizing, I mean, with industrializing firms that utilizes labor as the key factor in production. But you don't stop there because the key is to accumulate more capital. Then you upgrade your industries from labor intensive industries into capital uh, intensive industries in order to catch up with the industrialized economies. And how you do that? You do that through the development financing institutions because the problem we have been having in Africa is that most economies have been financing industrialization through the commercial banks. But remember, commercial banks are risk averse and short term. But industrialization is a long term process, which is really risky. And that's where development financing institutions comes in. Um, I think I've exhausted my 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lisako, for, for that presentation. I think the audience will agree that, you know, development finance does play a key role in, in industrialization, and I'm sure it sparked a few questions already. Um, but we'll leave those questions for later on for the Q&A. Let us skip to Sand's presentation because Sand is already here. Sand is an international trade and investment expert for the African market with more than 15 years experience working in a multicultural environment. He's the current executive director at African International Trade and Commerce Research. His achievements include being a lead technical consultant for the first independent study on the potential benefits of the FCFTA for Nigeria. His research work has been presented at a public hearing in the European um, Parliament and is actively participated in the UN Policy Hackathon on Model Provisions for Trade in Times of Crisis and Pandemic. Sand is pursuing a PhD at the University of Cape Town, Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. He holds a certificate in trade negotiations in an era of uncertainty from the European University Institute in Italy, a bachelor's degree in international trade and an MSE, MSc in international business management, both from the University of Portsmouth in the United Kingdom. So I um, thank you very much for the introduction. Where I come from, there's always an existing protocol and I stand on that existing protocol for because they've greeted everyone. So I don't need to repeat the greeting. Um, so my presentation this morning, um, seeking a fish, is going to be industrial policy response to trade circle in Southern African, in Southern African development community. Um, in the manual, um, it will be Southern Africa. So we're almost saying the same thing. Um, so basically, um, my presentation today, um, I will be giving a background. This background is in recent time, we've had government people across Africa re echoing the need for having an industrial policy in development. This is not just an African thing, it is a global issue and a global concern. Um, 
if you are listening to the news, yeah. you realize yeah. that the US government yeah. and the European yeah. Union yeah. try to bring back yeah. their production yeah. back to their country yeah. instead yeah. of outsourcing it. And for Africa in particular, AFCFTA has accelerated this conversation and of African government seeing the need to industrialize through industrial policy. Having said that, there are literatures across board that have emphasized. And if you listen to the keynotes I read this morning, the, Nora um, talked about the need for industrial development, industrialization to bring development to the continent. There is nowhere evidence has shown that development, curing the issue of unemployment, raising your GDP, you must industrialize. Evidence abound on this. So I will be speaking on this and I'll also be pulling out literatures through this paper on what has happened in the SADC region in recent time be between 2000 and 2021. What has been the trend? And the paper will also bring in model um, to, 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 to drive home my point, what I've discovered, what countries in the SADC region need to do, and as well as, as well as question some theoretical framework that is out there about industrialization, collective, what I say, collective industri industrial policy, which most regions in Africa promote. I will question it. And I will then profile my recommendation and then conclude. So basically, um, we might all know what industrial policy is about. It's only the government that can propose, implement, and initiate an industrial policy. It is not a private sector thing. It is a government intervention. And why is it so? Is to be able to empower domestic industries to be competitive. That is why industrial policy is implemented or initiated. But industrial policy do fail. We must understand this. And we must not shy away from this fact that industrial policy fail. And it fails on different reasons. Political coloration of industrial policy, misdiagnosis of industrial the solution for implementing industrial policy. Um, some of the reasons why industrial policy failed. And Africa in the 1980s social adjustment program was introduced to Africa by the Bretwood, the World Bank. I am of the view that the issue was not in the social adjustment program but it was the implementation. A lot of people differ, disagree with me on that, but it's fine. But my view is I haven't critically looked at the policy itself and as well as looked at the implementation. I realized that the implementers of the policy were not equipped enough or knowledgeable of what the structural adjustment program should do. And that is what led to the failure. It wasn't the program itself, but this is a different topic for another time. Industrial policy fail, so we must recognize it. And we must understand that for the failure, it is part of the process of learning and by doing. Industrial policy, most times you want to build up, maybe start adding value to coal. You see some domestic businesses, they say, we can do it. We can, you pump in resources into it not knowing if it will bring out their desired results. But when it fails, most times government pull back because resources have gone in. So I, I believe industrial policy under the conceptual framework is experimentation and learning by doing, which is necessary in the process. Trade circle. Trade circle is one of those things that every economies and people that work in trade ecosystem understand. 
Freak a circle can also be called business circle. It can also be called economy circle. It happens every two years. There will always be recession. <laughs> if you think recession will happen and it will not happen in your time, then we are not ready. And Africa must realize this. It is not your doing. There will always be growth. And I will show you the chart and there will always be downfall. But what do you do at that time? And this is always gauged, three circles is gauged by your GDP. Your GDP can always remain up. And we can see the test, the, the, the reality abound. When it goes up, this is development time. Government need to harvest and prepare for the raining day. But what we realized, especially in the Sadek region in recent time, is not we we are not conscious of this issue. We don't implement or increase our trade policy, industrial policy to address the farming days. So we keep on flowing with the tie and allow other people to advise us. I'm saying for us to get things right as African in the Sadek region, we must be able to understand the dynamics of economy and be able to on, understanding it and is about also implementing it. So the Sadek region is about 16 states, member states. We, are all, we might all be aware of it. We might not all be aware of it, but it's 16. But the data I'm going to be presenting will dwell on 15, and I'll tell you why when I get there. The mission really is to be able to create an enabling environment across the region so that every member state would be able to compete, not just domestically, regionally, but globally. But the interesting thing about having this conversation today or making this presentation is that between 2000 and 2021, AFCFTA is now a reality. So every region is now, with AFCFTA, the building blocks are the three regional blocks. And that means region, has to up their responsibility. And SADC is one of those regions that is in the forefront of supposed to do this. But theoretically, which I also am disputing, is that suppose there is an there is increased intra-industry trade within a collective region, in this case, SADC, greater trade integration is most likely to lead to collective implementation of industrial policy to address externality of trade circle. I disagree with this theoretical framework. Reason being that every member state is a sovereign state, independent of the region, and they have their own unique manpower and down resources, and as well as the expectation from the citizen. So if a region, regional organization introduces a pre-policy, most likely not every region will implement it. Most likely not every region will initiate reforms that would drive the ultimate game, aim of the industrial policy. So you might not get the same results when there is three circles. In 2009, when there was a global financial recession, some African countries were insulated from that recession. Some gained, some retooled, and some got, got in. Some were badly hurt. The same thing with COVID. Not every nation, even wise, we can say widespread, but some nations benefited us even from COVID. Same with sectors and businesses. So when we talked about theoretically that if every member state implemented that when trade circle happened, we all experienced the same thing that, that, will, add, that, will, that, will, that will lead to avoidance of destruction of our economy. I feel that is something practical, it's not really the reality. However, the theoretical framework that I looked at was about the theory of infant industry promotion of selective protection. This excludes import and as well as there are different ways this is implemented and I studied in my, in my presentation. I also looked at the ability to drive industrial policy is the ability to be able to enhance the capacity of an underdeveloped sector. 
that at the end of the day, it will lead to growth. So I based my, my methodology was, I used a time series data from World Development Indicator of the World Bank, and as well rely on trading economies um, data serve. These are the two re reliable data set that I found. And this also called for most of our regional organization, regional body, and SADEG inclusive, where you have data, when you have regions and you don't have, one can look, at, uh, check your website to get reliable data to, maybe, to make informed analysis. So I looked at several manufacturing sectors. I looked at the chemical, the food, the beverage, the tobacco, and the textile, and my French sector using the data to analyze. So the formulas are here. I used, um, what I discover is, is generally, Every, every member state within the region have, if a trade policy is implemented today, have different level of recovery when there is a trade circle. Some, because of their population they, and the over time implementation of trade industrial policy, recover faster. Some, it will take them five years. Some, it will take them three years. Some will take them 10 years. So, Kumaros data was not found, so I did not really look at Kumaros. So everyone, everyone I have looked at, I realized that for the periods under review, some of the data were missing, but the data were neg negligible. There weren't enough to be able to de discredit the entire data that I gathered. Um, about 330 data sets were, were, were mined from this which was a lot of a lot of um, um, data to make to come up with this this um, recommendation. I have every okay. So in the short run, I believe if industrial policy is implemented, it will have significant impact on the region. But for for the error connection, for correction, it shows that speed adjustment, for example. For, for you to be able to recover faster when there's a trace, which will happen very soon because we'll have COVID very soon. I, I, I'm not sure now if we're we'll going to the deep recession or the minor, but we should be ready for that as a people. For us to be ready, we must start, government must start putting in place trade policy, industrial policy that will address this eventuality that will happen. But what, we, what I realize is that most time, nations within the region, I'm emphasizing nations within the region have not put in place policies to address this. One of the reasons is they are carried away by other responsibility. At the end of the day, you then realize that industrial policy long run outcome is the variable. So in these places, I gave my finding in each country, the 15 countries in the SADC region. So there is a way out. There must be incentive given to industries. And this incentive is not politically colored. The incentive must be given to industries within because industrial policy targets specific industry or sector. And this incentive must be given to them for production. The barrier, the tariff reduction and not tariff barriers to trade, must, we must collapse it within the region. It's a good thing that now we have AFCFTA, and this gives us a more um, legal right to be able to open up our market. And for us to open up our market for trading goods and services, we must have domestic capacity to be able to engage the region, talk more of the, 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 um, the continent before we talk global. But if we don't, within, if, if countries don't deliberately support the industries we have now, when the trade circle happens again, we will not be able to respond. Just like in between 20, 2002 and 2021, I've looked at, countries are struggling within the region. But at the same time, there's also this challenge of 
who is who in the region. South Africa is doing very well, but there are countries that are, are blocking. Congo is not doing fantastic. Um, Angola is having issues. So in the full report, I gave uh, my, my recommendation. Next slide, please. Just, just one. So, um, so in, in press, <laughs> this guy, I can't really uh, dealt with, but I, I, I suppose it will be shared on, on, on the website. So um, finally, invest in education and training to improve human capital and productivity should also be tied to industrial policy. Industrial policy is a holistic thing that must be implemented. And the response so far in addressing trade circle has not been an encouraging one across the region. And I believe we can do more in practical terms. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sand. I think we should just apologize to you and listen, that is quite difficult for the audience to get a good grasp of your work if they can't see the presentation. Um, so I really hope you did get some gist of, you know, the conversation and we can engage uh, with some of his finding, uh, findings a little bit later on. Um, and as he said, all of the, these papers will be available on the TIPS website. So I encourage all of you to, to read them because they are quite interesting. Are there any questions um, that we can take now for Lesejo or Sand uh, based on those two presentations? Yeah, Melanie, please go ahead. Um, and if you can kindly just introduce yourself. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Melanie Roy. I'm from a research institute Um Mine is just uh, not so much, a, maybe just a bit of a question and a comment for both of the speakers. Um, the first speaker mentioned about, um, you know, the resources and the industrial upgrade and the relationship between capital and labor intensive industries. Um, I just wanted your view in terms of you, you mentioned that moving from labor intensive industries to capital intensive industries. Um, but what we find is that, you know, with all of the change and the transformation with digitization, mechanization, automation, is that labor intensive industries are reducing drastically because of the technological upgrade and transfers. And capital based industries are moving more to, to an industrialization, most certainly. But the, 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 the challenge lies with regards to getting the labor force on board in terms of their transformation process. Um, that all, also goes together with the structural adjustment programs that government has in place. And I think our second speaker has mentioned the importance of, you know, the, the role of the state in terms of implementing. And I think you mentioned a very, very important point is misdiagnosing what type of industrial policy is actually going to fit a specific context. When looking at industrial policy, I think it's pertinent to understand what type of economic landscape we find ourselves as sub-Saharan Africa. Africa. And you also mentioned between, um, you know, reducing tariff and non-tariffs, reducing tariffs. But I think that I just wanted clarity. Were you, were you referring to the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement tariffs reduced between um, inter-trade inter between the countries? Um, because what we find is that um, that would be a more viable option as opposed to removing trade barriers and tariffs between um, the global north and the global south. So I think that you've raised very, very important um, questions. And I think it's, it's, it's quite um, you know, imperative for us to look at the South African contents, uh, context and harness the local um, capabilities with, within sub-Saharan Africa. But, but you are absolutely right when you say that we've been misdiagnosed in terms of uh, one, um, the type of industrial policy because it's not a one size uh, fits all scenario. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks. Rendani uh, Mampiswana here from Nafasi Water. Uh, my question is for Lee Seko. Um, so I do appreciate the the requirement to shift from labor intensive to capital intensive, and it sounds good, but what needs to happen in reality for that to happen? Because in some instances, a, a labor intensive industry now to shift 
to a capital intensive, will that same industry be this one that makes the trajectory to a capital intensive industry? So I think there are other nuances that as much as conceptually it makes sense, that's what needs to happen. But what are the mechanics in reality that we need to navigate to be able to make the transition uh, as you've indicated? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I am Freeman Mateko from Invest of Johannesburg, South African Research Chair in Industrial Development. Uh, thank you for the powerful presentation, um, Liseho. Uh, my question to you is um, centered on uh, what is the role of political power um, in as far as industrialization is contained in Africa? And in context, uh, what is the issue of ownership of resources and control? Taking, for example, Zimbabwe. Um, it implemented a policy on land reform. But after that process, you find that um, the whole agricultural sector and other stakeholders within the value chain, they collapsed totally. And as a result, um, the, the, the industrial capacity is now low or it's, it's extremely low. And you find that um, the country which used to be an export is now a beggar from my view. So contextualizing this uh, from, uh, from this perspective, what can be done in reality in as far as those issues are concerned so that as Africa, we don't only set targets and provide blueprints, but we come up with um, um, durable solutions which are able to address the real issues which we face as Africa. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the three questions. Um, I think I'll lump them together. Um, so... When you think, let, let's start with the first question of the relationship between uh, resources and that industrialization. Um, I want to take you back to 1950s when the first phase of development thinking emerged. Uh, so during the time, the key idea in Africa was to catch up after the disruption of the World War II. Now, the, kind, the, the state there, the government played the developmental role that is, they were actually um, proactive in the market, building industries. But the kind of industries that they built in Africa were the sophisticated industries. But when you compare that with the, the nature of resource endowment that exist, existed in 1950s in Africa, you find that people, in terms of the technical know-how to work in these sophisticated industries, there was no skill. So there were beautiful, sophisticated industries that existed and the labor that uh, lacked the technical know-how. So these industries ended up being just the white elephants and that's how they collapsed because they were there, but no one could actually work in those industries. Now, to, now that also goes to a second question, I think, Generally, it refers to the fourth industrialization. Now, the key here is when you look at the structure of African economy at large, it's really dynamic and unique for each country. For instance, if you look at the level of development in South Africa, compare that with Lesotho. South Africa is a bit ahead. But when we get the recommendations from the World Bank, the Washington Consensus, they just give us the generic uh, 10 recommendations like um, open up to international trade, do this, do that, do that, all right? But they forget to look at each unique structure of the country. Now, if you're going to talk about industrialization in South Africa, you cannot speak about the same concept in Lesotho. Why? Because in terms of the technical know-how level of industrialization, South Africa is relatively a bit far. So it could be safe for South Africa to maybe try to enter into the fourth industrialization. But in, in Lesotho, for instance, there we still have a lot of um, labor relative to capital. So if you're going to build a uh, fourth industrial industries, they're going to end up as being the white elephants because our technical know-how in Lesotho is still a bit lacking. So to start, it's wise to start with the industries that are going to utilize the resources you have. For instance, if you have more labor, start with the industries that are going to employ more labor relative to capital. But the key to industrialization is capital accumulation. So for you to move from uh, labor intensive industries to capital uh, intensive industries, 
That's where now the government comes in to play the facilitating role in industrial and industrial upgrade. So you make sure that you move from the uh, labor intensive industries and dynamically transit into capital intensive in the industries. And that's where the government comes in. Uh, data connection, and information connection. What could, what could be the new uh, uh, the, the industries to incubate in the market? Where can we find the new markets, okay? That's a learning by doing process. So as you do that, it means the labor itself is gaining the technical know-how in these industries. And it's easy, it's easy for you to dynamically now move from the labor intensive industries into capital intensive industries. And the financing vehicle should also be able to allow that dynamic transition from labor intensive industries into capital intensive um, industries. So thank you, everyone. We're just going to put a pause on that, a pin in it, and then I will continue with the discussion after we've listened to Alex's presentation. So he is a senior researcher at the DSI NRF South African Research Chair in Industrial Development, uh, Sachi ID, uh, which is at the College of Business um, and Economics at the University of Johannesburg. His research interests focus on innovation, structural transformation, and techno technical change with ramifications on IP rights, export diversification, and natural resource-based development. So uh, apologies for the delay. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and be uh, as succinct as possible. So um, my, my presentation is on industrial policy for uh, technological sovereignty in the context of shifting geopolitical power. Um, as you know, industrial policy has been in existence um, for a long period of time, um, probably much longer than uh, what we are taught in uh, academic books, because even in, in ancient Greece, uh, in ancient Egypt, uh, industrial policy was already present. You, you, you just need to read the uh, Plato's Republic to uh, to see uh, strong elements of industrial policy, uh, but it, it has um, uh, received much more attention uh, with the development of uh, Japan and then uh, subsequently the development of Korea and um, uh, other East Asian countries. Um, uh, but it has uh, often been considered as being at odd uh, with um, the dominant uh, economics doctrine. Uh, so uh, the success of East Asian countries uh, by the use of uh, uh, industrial policies was typically characterized as uh, it was only useful uh, to the extent that it was uh, a correcting market failure or a coordination failure. And um, uh, after the Asian financial crisis, uh, so, so the the enthusiasm for uh, industrial policy actually went back and uh, uh, it, its existence was almost denied um, in the year that came, even though it was still being used uh, in the background. Uh, so the, the US has uh, never ceased to use it, but it was not really prominent in the uh, economic uh, discourse. Um, so uh, what uh, made me uh, interested in the revival of industrial policy, um, it was the current massive use of industrial policy tools uh, as the world realized that the globalization that uh, uh, had actually uh, kind of suppressed uh, the, the space for industrial policy uh, started to reach its limit uh, during the pandemic when we realized uh, that the, the global supply chains had uh, a lot of uh, vulnerabilities, and uh, especially uh, when uh, the uh, the U.S. realized uh, that with with the shortage of chips, it did not have the onshore capacity to produce uh, the most advanced chips. And the, also the realization that 
uh, China was uh, really uh, touching up uh, technologically, uh, uh, aspiring to dominate uh, the semiconductor uh, industry. And then uh, the realization by the, the Department of Defense of the US that whoever is going to control uh, the production of the most advanced chips is also going to control uh, the world economy uh, and possibly uh, reap the benefits of the leadership. So this industry particularly became the focus of massive use of industrial policy tools. Uh, so it's not just a usual industrial policy, but it's really uh, industrial policy tools on with the combination of uh, non-conventional means, uh, including um, alliances, including uh, uh, coercion uh, of other countries to, to, to form groups uh, that would put all of uh, the key elements of their industries and of their policies uh, to make sure that, uh, that uh, uh, countries or groups of countries uh, together get sovereignty uh, in the control of uh, the semiconductor industry in particular. There are other industries, but this one has, uh, uh, has a, a particular feature, um, first of all, because of its complexity. It's extremely complex, uh, but also the way that it operates uh, with, um, with the, uh, we are not going to the details really of how it operates, I will give some key elements, uh, but just to give you a picture, uh, the uh, um, extreme ultraviolet uh, uh, photolithography machine that is used to produce the most advanced chips now, uh, it's a machine of more than 100 uh, 50,000 uh, components uh, that cost upwards of uh, 200 million, just one machine. So operating, for instance, a, a chip factory, you have to invest upwards of uh, 20 billion US dollars. So in some factories cost 40 billion uh, dollars. And, you, uh, and after two or four years, they are totally obsolete, which means that you have uh, to recoup those investments within the space uh, of uh, of these two to four years. So you can imagine the, ty the type of tensions that uh, go into the organization, the structuring and the, and the technology, uh, and who dominates that industry is the one who is going to reap the benefits. So uh, the association of that, that type of uh, consideration to national security, uh, to um, e uh, economic sovereignty uh, has actually uh, exacerbated the space for uh, industrial policy uh, to the extent that uh, I found that the best way to analyze it was to, to take it as the, the classical uh, confrontation, uh, geopolitical, but also warfare confrontation between two countries because the tools that they are using are quite similar. So I approach this analysis with uh, a Sun Tzu's uh, art of war uh, to try to figure out uh, how uh, industrial policy tools are being used uh, to, su to suppress uh, each side trying to suppress the other, uh, gain sovereignty and prevail uh, in uh, in that confrontation or economic or technological race or whatever way we want to to call it uh, so I, I have put together the the, the core element uh, of uh, 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 Sun Tzu's framework for analyzing uh, how the dynamics of warfare uh, are um, evaluated and uh, in this paper I try also to evaluate uh, the 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 deployment of industrial policy tools uh, along uh, the same lines. Um, uh, just coming back to uh, the understanding and the complexity of the industry, uh, so to, to, to have an idea of uh, uh, the context under which those tools are being deployed. Uh, uh, we can't go to the details, but uh, most important is that uh, the, the industry uh, has um, uh, 
two main components. Uh, so the design phase and the manufacturing phase. And each of, of the phases is dominated by a, uh, some uh, uh, industry players. So you can see uh, on the design phase, uh, we have uh, mostly US companies that dominate. Um, and uh, on the assembly uh, and testing end of uh, uh, the, uh, the value chain, um, uh, we have um, companies from uh, uh, the other parts of the world, especially in the lower uh, in the lower side of the panel. So you have uh, companies like uh, TSMC, UMC, Samsung, uh, and uh, SMIC and uh, GSET. Uh, so uh, th these are the biggest players, and those tools uh, they are basically they are all. Uh, at, at the at the height of uh, uh, their technologies and the the industrial policy tools uh, are intended to play to to use all of these elements all of these players uh, in order to achieve sovereignty. So the U.S. on the one hand is trying to uh, after realizing that most of the uh, manufacturing capacity was located in Asia, is now trying to use huge unprecedented amounts and combination of uh, tools uh, to get uh, the manufacturing back on shore on US territory uh, by deploying um, billions, uh, billions, billions of dollars, uh, especially through this, the so-called the CHIPS and the Science Act that uh, apportioned $280 billion just for the sake of uh, uh, bringing back the manufacturing capacity in the US. So you can imagine that those who were playing with industrial policy tools, uh, these amounts are amounts that they could only dream of uh, to, to have at their disposal. Uh, so uh, another picture of uh, at the field. So uh, uh, we, uh, we have also different stages, uh, of course, of uh, uh, the tools and the equipment that are uh, used uh, uh, in this industry. Uh, so the ele uh, electronic uh, design and automation and core IP, is, as you can see on this picture, is highly dominated by, by the US that accounts for uh, three quarters. Uh, but next to that, you see that uh, those who are next to it are also its allies. So China, um, with with this uh, light blue color accounts for only a small fraction. And uh, you can see on the lower uh, side uh, of the panel that uh, in assembly packaging and testing, it is there that uh, China has a space uh, and US accounts for only 2%, uh, China for 38%, uh, and Taiwan for uh, 27 but Taiwan, uh, South Korea, and Japan are the U.S. allies in this industry uh, and are the ones that are forming uh, that kind of uh, alliance combination that is called uh, the Chip4 Alliance to try to bundle the, their industrial policy tools uh, to gain uh, a, a sovereign control of the supply chain. This is a kind of uh, industry uh, in which it is extremely difficult uh, to 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 have autonomous control of the supply chain because of uh, all of these elements, uh, so including the uh, semiconductor manufacturing uh, equipment, uh, including uh, the uh, uh, el electronic uh, uh, design automation, including the materials, uh, the human capital, uh, so uh, the, the the financing that is needed. Uh, so uh, this bring this brings us to uh, what has uh, China done and what has the U.S. done in order to uh, to prevail in this kind of confrontation. China, uh, as I mentioned before, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you've got five more minutes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So China has deployed this tool that is called. Um, made in China 2025. 
uh, so it's a, a multi-sector uh, development plan for smart innovation driven manufacturing. Uh, but the emphasis is really on uh, semiconductor industry, um, which has been given uh, uh, the priority. Uh, so the, 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 the tools that uh, were deployed um, are, first of all, the, the National Integrated Circuit uh, Industrial Investment Fund, uh, with the guidance of uh, how uh, the... Uh, uh, the subsidies, the, the research and development, uh, the human capital accumulation uh, would be encouraged by, by the uh, state apparatus. Uh, especially uh, important in this domain is uh, the role of human capital because uh, it's not just the usual human capital. It, uh, it must be highly sophisticated types of human capital. And uh, what characterizes this industry is that both US and China are really poaching the best talent, not just in their country, but around the globe. So uh, 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 how, how have the countries uh, uh, been uh, faring so far? Uh, so uh, an assessment based on uh, uh, some of the principles of uh, the art of war, uh, we can see that uh, both in the US and in China, the support for the type of uh, uh, policy and uh, industrial confrontation is almost unanimous. Uh, even uh, the Republicans that uh, uh, were traditionally pro-market have considered that in this kind of uh, uh, warfare, we need to set aside the free market doctrine because uh, what is at stake is extremely important. So who has the advantage? Uh, each part has its own advantages, but for the uh, the current state of affairs, uh, the US is dominant, uh, but its uh, leadership is declining. It controls some key chokeholds in electronic design automation, uh, but also controls, uh, you know, the a photolithography industry that is based in uh, in the Netherlands and uh, some key inputs of the industry based in South Korea and Japan. Um, the, the 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 small thing to uh, to put on this is that uh, there is the end of short term profit driven uh, uh, thinking because when they deploy all the tools of uh, chokehold. Uh, some companies in the U.S. that are uh, deriving most of their revenues from uh, Chinese market are likely to uh, to defect because of the loss of uh, revenues uh, if China decided to uh, to mirror the uh, the restrictions. So, what are the lessons for Africa? Um, despite the, the the shrinking space for industrial policy, uh, what China and the US are doing for sovereignty is actually relevant because it shows what African countries uh, can do uh, and the limits of what they can't, uh, but there is still uh, enough uh, space for deploying uh, industrial policy tools, especially when sovereignty is at stake. That's it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Alexis. Thank you all for the for the three presentations. Uh, the session is meant to finish at half past 11 because of the earlier delay. Um, I think that leaves us with about 15 minutes of engagement. So I think we can just go back to finishing those initial questions and then we'll take another round of questions. And also just to kindly ask, let's keep the questions quite short and the responses relatively short as well. Okay, thank you so much. I think the last thing that remained was um, how then practically do we move from labor intensive industries into capital intensive industries? Or maybe the last thing was about the political power ownership of resources. Um, just to, bri to briefly answer that question, I, I want you to think about China, for instance, and the USA, for instance. Um, initially, you remember China used to assemble the, uh, the Apple products parts, right? For, for for the US, simply because China is labor abandoned as its endowment resource structure, right? 
So it's doing this labor intensive, so intensive work. But the US is actually designing the um the 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 IP and everything because it's capital intensive. So it's investing in capital intensive uh, parts of the same product, and China is investing in labor intensive part of the same product. But so now, in terms of upgrade now into capital intensive, through assembling these parts, China was able now to know the technical parts of how to actually produce a, 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 an advanced product, new industries, uh, technological industries. And that's why now today we have Huawei, which is competing against Apple as the top two biggest industries in communication industries. I think that's how we learn by doing. Um, in terms of uh, the other question was related to political power. I think that boils back to the uh, economics of institutions, uh, property rights, like that. I'm also going to talk about uh, the example of China and UK. When UK wanted to establish the automobile company uh, in China, the China used that leverage that we have the market already because we have labor people who are actually going to buy. So for you to actually produce in China where you will get production at lower cost because labor is relatively uh, cheaper compared to capital. But you have to transfer technology while we are giving you labor supply. In that way, it means that even though China is relatively labor intensive, but through that agreement that the UK will also transfer technology, that's how it started to learn how to produce advanced uh, products in advanced or maybe perhaps fourth industrial uh, industries. I think I've addressed them. Okay, just for me to just uh, make quick intervention um, with the question and maybe just step in into um, what I think Africa should do as well, you know, in moving forward. Um, in terms of industrialization, under industrial policy, the government is at the center. Um, you can you hear um, um, what's his name? The last speaker talking about two hundred billion dollar for equipment. If I may ask, how many of us know the budget headline for our industrial policy in our country? I guess nobody knows because this is where we come from. It's money you use to get money, so you must empower your people. We talk about labor and rest of it. So our industrial policy must tie into. Our overall objective. What is our overall objective? Talking about breaking the barrier, let's look at Africa. And that, that is why ALCATA gives us a veritable platform to engage. And we must engage with all intent of making it succeed. At the Salek region, we must be able to, a simple thing as opening up our border and putting a mechanism in place where movement of people can be easy. It's a simple thing as that. Um, and we can then move on into the, because when you talk about industrial policy leading to industrialization, it is all encompassing. So government is at the center, breaking barriers that limit trade, not technical barriers should be eliminated because the end game should be what we should be looking at. And we must not end game of five years, end game of 20 years. And that is why I commend the AU for the agenda 2063. And the, the cash word now is made in Africa. So it doesn't matter if it's made in Luset, uh, Luset, um, Malawi, Lusetu, Mozambique, but the, the, it's a value chain. For example, the textile industry. Do you know that in the entire Africa, we don't have the capacity from A to Z in clothing? We don't have subject matter as well. So industrial policies, we start looking at it. And as Africans, we can compete globally by basing our industrial policy on Ubuntu. Be your brother's keeper. Don't put policies in place that will be anti your neighbor or anti your, your region. And if you, I'm saying a lot of things, meaning government have a serious lot to play. However, the private sector and in thinking or embody institutions, the research institutions also have a role to play because that is where we support now with evidence-based research. If I tell you the amount that China or the US 
invest in research and development, you'll be amazed. I commend tips for keeping this going because what we do, we're betting new ideas. And we're betting new ideas that will be able to take care of Africa going forward. Um, I think I might, uh, yeah. So one other thing I want us to talk in misdiagnosis of industrial policy. Every, most industrial policies that are implemented, there is no need assessment before that time, and there is no ongoing evaluation. So you implement policy, you assess it, and be truthful to yourself to pull back. I said, industrial policy do fail, but we must understand it's learning by doing. You can't look at your failures and pull back. You learn, and you then take account and build up. By so doing, give yourself, give Africa in the next 20, 30 years. It's not a short-term thing. We can be able to compete globally. But yet, first, let's compete. Let's collaborate domestic, uh, regionally. Let's collaborate continental-wise. Then we can then engage the global community in the other phase of our industrial policy. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Sand. I just want to check if there's a roaming mic somewhere. Oh, it's over there. Okay. Um, can we maybe take another round of questions? And also remember Alexis is online for questions as well. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, my name is Toto Matsidi, so I'm from Department of Science and Innovation. Um, I think mine is more of um comments rather than questions. <clears throat> um, for example, um Leseko on your presentation, you mentioned um the the issue of trying to go labor intensive which i partly um agree with you but at the same time i'm i'm thinking of reality as my um colleague said here the there is this um for ir which in in my own opinion opinion has been sort of overused if not loosely used in terms of us talking about it and doing less about it as Africa. And there is now currently the Africa free trade, which everyone is talking about. Um, and you wonder how many are doing something about it. Because we 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 are still locked in our um national foreign policies, especially on trade as African countries. And and you find that it's it's difficult to 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 even try and enforce some of the 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 the, the um, taxes to even your own neighbor your own neighboring countries and when I say neighbor I'm saying like within SADC within 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 Africa I mean the the north and south so when you look at that situation as it is is already um making it difficult to trade as 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 african countries so the 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 minute our governments start to be decisive and act on what the free trade is talking about and it doesn't need to be that um um you you need to open all your borders it's okay we, we need, no 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 i don't I, I don't think it's it's that but we need to start making those baby steps as as countries look at what china has has been doing they didn't start big you you mentioned clearly that they started um assembling and and doing all that just around here in in in, in pretoria we've got um um manufacturing uh, plans of um, BEM and so forth, we are assembling. At what time will we start now to have our own? And, and the more we intensify that, the more we grow that. And we can't do it alone. So hence I'm saying, I think it's a question of us starting to be, to be decisive, invest in, in that. And my last point is, I think you've mentioned to say, if we can ask ourselves, how many countries in Africa are investing even 1.5 of the uh, budget on research and innovation? None. We're not investing in that. But we want to sit at the last, at the end of the queue to reap from what we did not invest in. And I think that should be one of the start that you invest in your R&D, you invest in your um, startups because they make money. The reason why a startup is made is to make money, 
So I think we need to, to, to look into that. And us as colleagues here, this is one other way we can enforce and get um, political will from forums such as this to say, this is the recommendation that we put into to, to our leaders. And so thank you so much. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Toto. Um, we're just going to take uh, input from Alexis. He's just put his hand up. He's online. We'll come back to you shortly. Uh, please go ahead, Alexis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, in reaction to what has been said, I just want to caution uh, a kind of reading um, of uh, China's development uh, as uh, having been led by, you know, simple assembly and uh, uh, acquiring technologies uh, through uh, the demonstration effect. Uh, we may be tempted to see the surface of uh, what we are told, uh, but just think of uh, the current uh, domination of the rare earths uh, that are crucial for uh, the armament industry and uh, the electronics industry itself. Uh, for instance, uh, China controls 100% of the production of high temperature magnets. It's not the result of just uh, copying uh, designs. They have invested billions uh, of dollars in laboratories for 40 years plus. So they have been preparing the terrain. Uh, their current uh, capacity uh, to, to, to climb the technological ladder did not just come from reverse engineering. They, in um, in the past, they have prepared by uh, founding laboratories, by uh, preparing human capital. And if we fail to take that into account, uh, uh, we may actually misread uh, how they developed. So they control the cobalt refinement today. Even Western countries rely on China for the control, for, for, for instance, uh, lithium. So it's more complex than just uh, labor intensive. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Sorry, the gentleman up there. Yeah, thank you so much. My name is Dr. Kiru Strongwe. I'm coming from the University of Johannesburg. Just a quick question to Lesoko there. Uh, in your presentation, of course, you highlighted the importance of TFIs, development finance institutions, in order to spur or support industrialization. Now, of course, my concern is that if you look at DFIs by nature, especially on the African continent, uh, political interference is eminent as well as evident. Not only that, but also the funding aspect of it, the financing part of DFIs is very poor. And in order to spur industrialization, I mean, financing is the key or is key. Uh, how do you strike that balance indeed? And also, I don't know whether we have got a classic case of a country that has industrialized based on financing from DFI. Thank you so much. Awesome. We're just going to take one last question. Um, I'm Donald Mackay, the CEO of XA Global Trade Advisors. <clears throat> just perhaps a, a comment on what Sand had said. Um, I, I think the continental agreement, most would agree, is absolutely essential. Uh, but I do concern myself that it may not be sufficient um, to get the kind of development we'd like to see in Africa. And particularly, the research that we do uncovers that everyone in Africa wants to export, nobody wants to import. Um, so that's clearly a bit of a challenge. Um, we also have to look at the amount of uh, the dependency on border taxes as a percentage of, of revenue earned. So in South Africa, that's a relatively low amount, about 3% of our total revenue pool, but we've got countries in Africa where that exceeds 30, 35%, and then it becomes a really big problem. Um, you know, in some ways, if the agreement succeeds, um, the countries kind of don't have money. So they've we, we've got this compensation fund, which is, is meant to uh, fill that hole. But also the, the, the non-tariff barriers, the incentive to remove those um, kind of diminishes as the, the duty levels themselves drop off. So if there's, if there isn't a, sorry, perhaps just a final comment, there also is a very poor level of trade 
um, complementing between different countries. So if we have a look, you know, most countries in Africa are, are digging rocks out of the ground and putting them on a ship and sending them either to Europe or to the East or wherever the case might be. Uh, and then they're importing all of the stuff that's manufactured. If I look, we, we did a study across 14 states in Africa and tried to have a look at how their trade patterns look relative to South Africa. And we had we had less than a 2% overlap of, of trade on products that would actually um, realistically move at the moment. So there's, there's also the challenge that we, it's not enough to kind of have the policies and to have the politics because the politicians love talking about the agreement, but how does this actually get implemented? If we look at South Africa, um, just in the recent past, in the kind of last two to three years, we've we've passed a clothing and textile master plan, which has a direct attack on Lesotho and Eswatini's clothing and textile sector. So the policy is designed and written into the policy to shift employment out of those countries into South Africa. You look at the sugar master plan, first page of the sugar master plan, and we we have a point made that um, we've implemented our health promotion levy. This has taken 200,000 tons of sugar out of South African production. Eswatini sends about 300,000 tons of sugar into South Africa. They need to find another market for it. So the, these are these are actions which, which these are not unintended consequences. They're absolutely intended. So when we talk about creating an African set of value chains, um, much of our behavior would appear to contradict the the intention and uh, so that does make me fear that you know whatever else we put on paper that there isn't an actual commitment to the hard decisions um, there rather is a commitment to media releases awesome thank you so much for those comments i'm just going to quickly rush to to the last question i think Tebokho um had his hand thank you very much um my name is Tebokho from the DTSC. i just want to have an understanding um on the historical context of growth vis-a-vis uh, -vis government ownership because the state was owning um, in in those countries which were presented it was not only uh, facilitating now do you think africa will grow and achieve those levels seven percent growth per annum um, if the state is only facilitating or do we need a a a a, a balance, you know, um, and and what needs to be done? Um, and also all the uh, presenters, I didn't really get a view as to what Africa needs to do in in structurally changing its um, economic trajectory. You know, and 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 the role of different um, um, social uh, partners, and lastly, given that most African countries are resource-based economies, what kind of economic structure do we need? You know, and which are conditions appropriate to accelerate growth given that basically even the you know you look at the the exports from other african countries that are linked to um resources you know then how do we drive growth under such conditions thanks sure thank you i'm just gonna ask the presenters to give their concluding remarks as you're reflecting on these questions. Um, so I'm just going to start with Alexis online and then we'll finish off in the room. Uh, please go ahead, Alexis. Uh, and please, can we keep it to a minute on the on the closing remarks? We're out of time. Okay, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I just want to keep it short. I may be focusing on uh, uh, natural resources and, and labor intensive uh, considerations that uh, are most of the time presented to be uh, a kind of uh, uh, advantage, uh, comparative advantage for Africa. Um, this issue of resources 
is extremely complex because uh, the, the way resources are present uh, in Africa uh, is not in a form that can be readily used. So there are complex value chains before, uh, when we talk about cobalt, for instance, be, before cobalt can even be used. So we need to be very careful when thinking of uh, uh, the resources. Uh, Nigeria has just uh, put together its uh, first refinery and we hope that uh, we will get the human capital needed to develop the resources, but it needs a lot of investment. Let me keep it there. Okay, thank you so much. Um, these are all important questions. Um, I I just want to maybe reiterate a little bit on the China case because we've been mentioning China as the case study on its approach to industrialization. Um, China is a huge country and the level of technology and the skill set is quite dynamic. One of the approaches that was used by China that happened to be successful was the dual approach uh, strategy. The dual approach strategy was let's have two um, let's let's uh, have the labor intensive industries we have a high unemployment rate in China. So they developed the labor intensive uh, industries that supplied clothing, textile and everything. That's why they call themselves the factory of the world in terms of uh, labor intensive commodities. At the same time, concurrently, they opted to industrialize their uh, economy, moving towards the fourth industrial revolution. They did that through what they call the, uh, the specialized economic zones. So they identified some of the regions within China where the level of uh, technical know-how was a bit higher. And they employed people there to work on those industries that are focusing towards the fourth industrial revolution. And that's how it became um, successful. So these things are really dynamic in, in nature. There's no um, yes or no answer to them. But we have to try these things based. Um, I want to emphasize that they have to be based on our endowment resource structure. Um, the other important question was on like, how do we uh, maybe the resources that we have? We have different resources across different countries. So the best to do is each country must utilize the resources that it has. For instance, in my case in Lesotho, we have abundance of water and we try a lot to utilize the water. We supply South Africa with water. We are also in negotiations with uh, Botswana to supply them with water. By doing so, we are utilizing our own resources. It, make, it gives us comparative advantage in, in water industries. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, so my, my final intervention, I would, is just like three. We need more political champions in AFCFT, serving and retired. Um, and we must commend ourselves thus far we've come. AFCFT is less than five years. And, you know, Abuja Accord, you know, Lagos Protocol has over the years, and this is the time we're having conversation on how can we trade among ourselves. I think Africa, let's not beat ourselves and say, oh, what is going on? A lot is going on, but it will take time. And I also find it worrisome for nations, just like um, 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 South Africa put in uh, um, sugarcane policy, sugar policy, and targeting their neighboring under SADC. And this is something that we have to, through advocacy, discourage. There are value chains. So what we need to do next, we need to define our value chains and develop them. Because for sugar alone, if you look at it, there are a thousand and one value chain, and everybody can specialize on that. Even water you mentioned, there are a thousand. And one. Let's African stop looking at just the small part. If your neighbor has taken one part, you take that part. And thirdly, Ubuntu is important. Why is it like difficult for us to be able to trade with ourselves? Information asymmetric. You don't know what is happening in the other country because they are hiding it from themselves. There is no platform to engage. Even for intellect, we've never talked about intellectual property, which is most times the basic for even being a long term investment capacity for an organization and for a country. So information asymmetry must open up to our brothers and our neighbors um, in terms of business. Um, partnership, partnership, partnership. 
public-private partnership and funds is involved and government can only lead the way in making those high ticket uh, funds available for this industrialization we are talking about. For Africa, let's commit ourselves. We are on the right path, but we must not give up. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, just in closing, uh, thank you so much for everyone in attendance and for the engaging discussion. Uh, the papers will be available online, so please feel free to download. And as we get into the tea break and during the rest of the conference, please do engage with the presenters around the questions that were answered in part and, and some not at all. Uh, so please feel free to engage with them. Thank you so much. <laughs>